So I'm in Cusco, Peru, planning a three-day ride to the Chilean border with local bike rider Angelo as my guide. The plan was for him to accompany me on the first three days until I got to the border with Chile and then he would ride back. Didn't work out that way, but anyway. <laughs> now this is day one of what turned out to be a years long trip. The plan was to ride almost 400 kilometers southeast from Cusco to Puno on Lake Titicaca. We had to go up over a high pass in the Andes over 14,000 feet or 4,338 meters. I was very inexperienced because I'd only ridden a bike four days in the last 30 years and only 260 kilometers or so on this particular brand new bike. But I'd been planning it for years and I was so excited to finally get on the road. And we did see quite a few interesting things, but I'll let the video do the talking. Although I'd packed the night before, in the daylight a few problems became obvious. One was that the bags were a lot more voluminous than I envisaged. I had a lot of clothes, camera gear, stuff like that, tent, sleeping bag, it all takes up space. Angelo is going to get by with that small bag for six days, whereas my bags have to last me six months. You see there's a blue broom handle on the back. That I was going to mount the camera at some point looking over my shoulder. And also I put a couple of streamers in there. I got the idea from the guy in the last episode, the, the gas cylinder delivery bike guy with his orange flag. Not that anybody's going to miss seeing my bike, I don't think. They'll, they'll probably have a heart attack, die laughing when they see me coming down the road. Not that I really care. I wanted to bring all this stuff and I don't care if people think I, I'm crazy. <laughs> And another problem was on that particular day, workmen were digging a ditch and half the road was closed off. There was mud everywhere, it was quite deep. And there's only this crumbly section for us to ride across. Well, I thought, at Wacky we'll cross that bridge when it gets to it. At the last minute, I chickened out and I delegated the riding of that to Angelo. He had heaps more experience than me. Finally, three and a half months after I had that accident on the rented bike, and I came so close to giving up my dream of doing this bike trip, we're finally on the road. Let's hit the road, Jack. Round the first corner and almost run over two pedestrians. <laughs> oh man, it was wet and miserable. One last time under the green coat hanger. Well, the rain is to be expected. February is the second rainiest month in Cusco. At least Angelo has finally fitted some rear vision mirrors to his handlebars, so at least he can see if I'm following him. As the rainy and miserable weather kind of got worse, it sort of dulled my enthusiasm for the ride. This is the ride that I've been planning for years and years, but it started off with nothing but rain and fog and traffic and ugh. There's the landmark condor. Mike, a friend of mine who lives in Cusco, said that that condor, the metal for it was melted down from a, a crashed Russian aircraft. It was wet, but it wasn't that cold because it's summer here and, and we're in the tropics. Although due to the altitude, it wasn't hot either. Hey, look out, mate. It's times like these I wish I had one of those helmet to helmet intercom radio things that you can get. Our first pit stop was Lake Urkos because the rain let up a little bit and Angelo said I should stop 
check all the straps after five or ten kilometers check that they're still tight and not getting loose which is good advice also my cheap helmet was fogging up so I had to lift the visor so I could see and look at the result of my glasses and also the waterproof bag for my drift action cam ¿Cuánto faltamos? Ah, como siete horas. <laughs> Our next stop was near the town of Combapata, where we rode over a bridge over the river Salca. Salca is a Quechua word that means uncultivated, indomitable or sullen. We were on Peruvian Highway 3S, we went over that metal bridge, but then we looped back. And we came to this colonial bridge made out of stone, dating to 1604. It has withstood many a flood and centuries of traffic between Cusco, La Paz and cities further south in South America. Then this little boy started saying, there's a house inside, there's a house. And Angelo didn't believe him, but we went up and had a look. I can only guess it's where a toll collector or a guard lived down there. It was very well built, this bridge, the closer I looked. Look, there's a stone rain gutter sticking out the side there. But hang on, what are those pillars? in the background there. At a guess, I'd say they're the foundations of an Inca bridge, of which only a couple remained, and there's one not far from here called Keswachaca. Uh, the Incas used rope made from woven grass to string bridges between pillars like that over rivers. Waman Poma's book says that each town that had a bridge like that had an allocated bridge master whose job was to oversee the upkeep and maintenance of these rope bridges. Here you can see a coca leaf motif painted on the rocks. My guess is it's a symbol for a political party. This village of Chektyuk was interesting, if not a little sad. It had some interesting buildings which mixed masonry, adobe, corrugated iron, like this church, but most look abandoned with broken windows. In fact, Angelo said, let's go for a walk around and we only saw a few kids and this little old lady. You could definitely say it's going to be a ghost town, or it already is. <laughs> I learned something today. You see how this is like a gun barrel straight road and the buses and trucks come roaring down here and one bus overtook another vehicle just where me and Angelo's bikes were parked and it must have missed my bike by half an inch. I expected to see it fall over or knocked over just from the suction of the wind. And I made a mental note, park as close to the curb as possible in these kinds of situations. From this point on, the road started rising very steeply. Oh man, look at that snow, llamas grazing. We really feel like we're in the Andes. At this point, my bike really started to feel the altitude. Back to second and third gear, struggling to keep up with Angelo and his Honda. Finally, we got to the pass, the highest point. It's called Abra La Raya, and it's 4,338 meters, which is about 14,200 feet above sea level. And it was freezing. Tourist buses stop here for a photo op. And there's these hardy Peruvian women who brave the cold, the rain, probably hail and snow to sell llama wool jumpers and gloves and stuff to tourists. Yeah, it was freezing up here, but the good news was it was all downhill from now on, though not that far downhill because the Altiplano is a lot higher than Cusco and it's got a good name, Altiplano. It's high and it's flat. In the town of Ayaviri, we stopped for lunch. This lady pulled out of her cloth and paper bag some cooked mutton. Well, I think it was mutton. <laughs> she said it was mutton. This is how they clean potatoes in Ayaviri. And I did see that dog drinking from the same tub afterwards. The meal was served like this and it was quite tasty. No knives or forks were provided and we just munched on the bones like we were cavemen. With the high altitude pass behind us and more than halfway there, we filled up with gasoline. But Angelo said we still had the most dangerous part ahead. And I'll, and I'll tell you why in a minute. With around 200 kilometers already done, I was really starting to enjoy this ride, which was going to be my longest ride yet. We were officially now traversing the Altiplano. This is what they call a piaje or toll station. Luckily in Peru, motorcycles travel for free. There's a little shrine to a roadside accident, one of millions that you see all over South America. There's a few more roadside shrines. You can see just how flat and monotonous it is. Then it started raining. 
Oh. This is the town of Pukara. Now the main road just goes straight through the middle and you can pass through it in less than two minutes. I'm going to speed it up and I would have done it in one minute if I hadn't been stuck behind that truck. I've lost Angelo. I don't know where he is again. He must be ahead somewhere. So there you have it, through the mighty metropolis of Pukara in less than a minute and a half. More Altiplano. The maximum speed I did today was 77 kilometers an hour. I'm still running the engine in, so I can't sort of really open it up. You see the lone dog on the left there? I wonder who owns him. There's no houses around. Looks like it rained not long ago here on this road. Oh yeah, the sun's come out. Now that's just wonderful. It's just so much more pleasant riding in the sun. Looks like we're coming into Juliaca. Now Angelo said he despised Juliaca and he advised we ride straight through without stopping and stay in Puno, the next town, which means we would have to backtrack on day two and come back into Juliaca. He just didn't want to stay there because he had escaped an attempted robbery at the traffic lights in Juliaca by a gang of guys on motorbikes and he escaped simply by accelerating through the red light and bipping his horn at the same time to draw attention to himself and got away that way. Now Angelo was quite adamant about the dangers of Juliaca but you know I've been around, I've lived in South America and people always say the next village or the next country or the next region, they're the bad guys. Well I was curious and I got on the internet and checked out the statistics. What is, like, for example, the murder rate in Juliaca? Lima, the capital, which is a huge city of more than 10 million people, it's always on the news and has a reputation of being a hotbed of crime. Seven homicides per 100,000. Cusco, where we just left, is more than double that, at 15 per 100,000. Now, Puno, the region of Puno includes the town of Puno and the town of Juliaca. That's at 20, which is almost three times Lima. But the place where we're going to stay on day two, Arequipa, has the highest of the lot, 30. That's more than four times higher than Lima and double that of Cusco. And by the way, compared to my home country, Australia, which has roughly around about one per 100,000, it's 30 times more dangerous. But, you know, if you worry too much about statistics, you'd never go out your front door because you'd be scared of getting hit by a car or a meteorite. You know, it's still a very low ratio, 30 per 100,000 murders in a year. And we're only going to be there for one day, so you can divide that by 365. <laughs> You know, I can live with that, and I don't think anybody should be afraid of coming to South America just because of that. Welcome to Juliaca, altitude 3,824 metres. Now that sign says the bridge ahead is called Puente Maravillas, which means bridge of marvels, wonders, miracles. <laughs> well, you can decide. Does it look marvellous or wondrous or miraculous? Nah, looks pretty ordinary to me. But maybe something miraculous happened here in the past. Nice name anyway. <laughs> Coming into Juliaca, I didn't have the camera on, but we went through a roundabout, we took a wrong turn, and Angela said, we've got to double back and then we just got to go through the traffic here, take the right turn and persevere through all the traffic and we'll get to Puno. Now what I didn't expect, and I don't think Angelo expected either, was the bad state of the roads here. It, it is the rainy season, but for such a big town, you know, I didn't expect to see so many deep and muddy potholes in the road. But there's zillions of potholes, as you'll see. There's a lot of people around, but it seems very safe to me. Look at that guy there on that bicycle. Actually, it's a tricycle, a cargo trike. So here we are doing a U-turn. He realised he'd taken a wrong turn almost straight away and we didn't lose that much, maybe a few hundred metres. Now we're turning right here. This is the road we missed and we should have taken. The potholes and railway tracks. Oh man, caught between bicycles, three-wheel tuk-tuks, micro-buses, semi-trailers, it's all here. Man, this is in poor condition, this road. Check out those guys sitting in the back of a three-wheeled ute or camioneta, as they call it in Spanish. This is called Highway Tres S. 3S, which is supposed to be one of the main highways in Peru, but gee, it's bad. 
Oh man, traffic. Nice place for a truck to get a flat tire. Uh, more potholes. Ah, now it's better. This reminds me of a computer game with all the hazards and obstacles that keep popping up. That looks like some sort of electrical cable they've just strung across the road there. Oh no, I've lost Angelo again. Oh no, more exhaust smoke. <coughs> See, there's a guy riding on the cargo on the back of that truck. What's the cargo on that truck? Looks like a bunch of wooden poles. Ah, some good road, finally. Oh no, spoke too soon. How much more of this? When I heard the name Huliaka, I thought it was maybe something from Greek or Roman language or something like Julian or Julian the calendar or something, something with Julie. But it actually comes from Quechua. Huliaka comes from Shuyakaka, which means dew upon rocks. But if I was in charge of giving a name to this road, I would call it something else. I would call it Tookanyan, which is Quechua for Camino de Huecos or road full of holes. <laughs> Or maybe we should call this road Camino de Huecos Sin Fin, the never-ending road of holes. <laughs> ah, dry and firm at last. Hopefully we are reaching the edge of town now. Uh-uh, spoke too soon again. Angelo just pulled us over here to ask if I was going okay because he appreciated that <laughs> I was finding it a bit tough being my first day with the bike fully loaded and having come so far and having been several hours on the bike now. But uh, I was going right. I was enjoying it actually. Ah! Copped a spot of mud on the camera lens there. Oh well. That sign says don't dump rubbish, but then 50 metres along, there's a lot of rubbish dumped on the side of the road. Looks like a couple of small shrines in the middle of the road there. Oh no, which way did he go? It looks like right is where all those tracks lead. Now there's a new problem. The sun's directly in our eyes. I can't hardly see where I'm going. We must be heading west, I guess. Ah, it looks like we're joining a better road. You see these occasionally in South America, around about, and they've got all the flagpoles there. Ah, uh, that sign says, Fathers, don't speed. Your children are waiting for you at home. Usually these overhead signs for phone companies demarcate the edge of town. Ah, uh, that biker flashed me. I wonder if there's something up ahead. But the only thing I saw ahead was this Keiko Fuhimori sign. <laughs> Watch those speed bumps. Here's another speed bump. It does seem like we're finally leaving Juliaca. Ah, first glimpse of Lake Titicaca. Now this should be Puno. Bienvenidos a Puno or Welcome to Puno. Puno supposedly means Desierto en la Altura, or High Desert, but the etymology is a bit uncertain. Nice view. This is where having a guide is an advantage. Angelo knew this is the best place for a panorama, because he's been here before. I would have spent quite a while riding up and down looking for it myself. 
He, he did ask me, do you want to do it now or tomorrow? Because uh, the light was fading. But I said, look, it's not raining now, so we'll make hay while the sun shines, even though the sun's just about gone. It was only then that I realised the camera housing had a bit of mud on it. While Angelo talked to some locals over there, I was able to take a quick handheld panorama. It was a bit blurry, but it was okay. And these inquisitive kids, I gave them some stickers and they seemed in awe of me. <laughs> well, it's not the motorbike. Motorbikes are common. It must have been all the coloured bags that I had on there. Hey, this is fun, coasting downhill. I'm glad he stopped because I lost him again for a minute. The buildings here do look somewhat more upmarket than the ones in Juliaca. Ugh, more potholes. Oh, there's a marching band. Who knows purple dinosaur there? Hey mum and kids, look out. Now that looks like a World War II pillbox. <laughs> hmm, get the feeling we're getting close to the centre of town. Yeah, this looks like the main plaza. Looks like they're setting up for some sort of live show. And there's definitely a lot of people on the street. Ah, oh, I like it when Angelo uses his turn indicators. Because it's getting dark and at least I can see when he's about to veer off some side street. So this hotel is called the Hotel Eriquipa. I minded the bikes while he went in and asked if they had a room. And we got a room, but we were very lucky because tonight there were street parades and the carnival of Puno was in full swing. And Angelo's been here before and he says they do have a secure garage, which obviously we needed. These lovely ladies were staying in our hotel as well. Later on we went for a walk and we knew something was up because people started whistling all of a sudden. You immediately realise there's no pretentiousness amongst these people. They just want to have fun. Now these dancers just kept reminding me of Doctor Who's Daleks. Doctor Who's dancing Daleks. Well, it did seem like everybody was enjoying themselves, which is the way it should be. And one thing I noticed coming from Cusco, there were very few foreign faces. I didn't see any that I remember uh, in the crowd, unlike Cusco where they're everywhere. To be in one of these bands, you've got to practice a lot. You've got to dance while you play. You've got to maintain formation and you've got to have a very nice uniform. Quite a lot of skills involved. And those brass wind instruments don't look cheap either. I guess it's born into the people. And some of them are even exposed to it before they're born. So that's the end of day one. Pretty successful, I thought. Seven and a half hours in the saddle, almost 400 kilometres covered, without any major dramas. But the next day, <laughs> there were dramas. Didn't cover a fraction of the distance, but it was still pretty interesting. Well, you've heard of beginner's luck. Well, this is beginner's bad luck. Nice way to travel. Aren't they cute? There's something strange about this rock. Supposedly, the pre-Columbians didn't know about magnetism. Bingo Loco asks... Hit the subscribe button. Please subscribe.